Hey everybody, welcome back to Breakfast with Bob, Boston Marathon Edition. We are presented and hosted by Highlands, Stop Your Cramp, Not Your Race, and by Polar, Chase Your Destiny. So excited to have with us the first woman to finish the Ironman Triathlon World Championship with a prosthetic leg, Sarah Reinertsen. Sarah, how you Hi, doing? Bob. Good to have you. Yeah, a round of applause from our audience. I Thank love you. that. And a gentleman <laughs> who's just starting the process. He was hit by a car a number of years ago and uh, March of 2013, his name is yes. Alec McManus. How are you doing, Alec? I'm doing very well, thank you. Wonderful to have you with us. So, Alec, take us back a little bit. What, sure. what were your sports growing up? So I was growing up, I'd say soccer was my main sport. Baseball, I seemed to be good at, yeah. so I stuck with it. Basketball, I couldn't play, I don't know why. Tall, 6'1", so everyone assumed I'd be good at basketball, I just never stuck. So baseball and soccer was kind of my... Now, did you run at all? I didn't do track running, but I did do running as part of everything else I was doing. Yes. So jogging was always part of... Soccer players uh, run an track. average of a 10K for every yeah. game. So you got, you got to have some run play. skills to play soccer. Yeah. yeah. At least soccer. Yeah. You should be able to run for baseball, too. But yeah, soccer, you're moving the whole time. I mean, you do... It's a skill. Yeah. Perfect. And Sarah, growing up, a little, little different, Alec got hit by a car, Correct. and you were walking on a sidewalk near your house? Yeah. I, it was in Western Mass. It was a kind of disgusting day. I decided that I didn't want to get my car out of the parking lot, so I was walking to an appointment, and then out of nowhere, I was, you know. Elderly driver. An elderly driver, he had lost control of his SUV. I was on the sidewalk. So that ended up pinning me to the sort of supporting wall, one of those nice garden looking. Yeah. Um, I managed to, luckily enough, I had the cell phone in the other pocket. So I, he didn't have a phone. And this is the middle of nowhere, Western Massachusetts. Uh, so I called the police myself too from the side. While block. you're pinned. Yes. Oh my God. So you're still being pinned. Yeah. So when I was, so he backed up actually. I was kind of, yeah. I'm not right. <laughs> my memory of that's not super clear, but I did call 911 in shock. Wow. And when you were in the hospital, what was the prognosis? What did they tell you? <laughs> I don't remember what they originally told me. Yeah. I, um, after I had regained some cognitive ability to sort of think through things, they were they came down to either limb salvage surgery or amputation, and they were very heavily towards the former to try to keep the leg. Keep the leg. Try to yeah. salvage as much yep. as they could. And that was 2013? This was 2013, yes. How long, how many different surgeries did you deal with? I think about 20, but I did lose count. 20 surgeries? Yes, of various severity. And yeah, but during that time, was there like a light at the end of the tunnel where they said, after we do this surgery, you'll be able to walk well again? Well, there was, and with, for me, one of the big things is with the limb salvage surgery, I always had drop foot because I did have some nerve damage, but I could feel the bottom of my foot and I had that particular system was still working. And that was the big argument. So I wouldn't, I would be able to walk. They said I'd have, you know, be able to walk eight hours a day or so, but I don't think I'd ever be able to like run on that. Right. So it was uh, late at the end of the tunnel that was also kind of something to reckon with. And what changed? When, when did you start leaning the other way that maybe amputation was the way to go? I think I became more aware over time of the limitations that I would have to be dealing with in a sense. The fact that I wouldn't be able to run, that I would be dealing with a higher sort of moderate pain. And that was coupled with the fact that I kept returning for surgeries that did not... Didn't really do anything. Didn't make yeah, they it any didn't better. actually do anything. And they had a percentage of failure chance to be fair, but they just didn't, you know, for me it didn't work out. And that kept going on. And I was getting more sort of medicalized in my thinking, which isn't great. Right. You know, when you're in and out of surgery, it's kind of this... Medications, too? Yeah. Managed to get off those as fast as possible, for the most part. Sounds but like it was painful, too. Yes. Yeah, and it did have... I was worried a little bit with the prosthetic direction about, like, phantom pain and some of these other things, but my pain quotient is so much lower, actually. And what, when, when, did you, when did you finally make the decision? So I moved back to Boston, and that was, I think that was really clutch in terms of just the culture of how people think about it here. And I got a new doctor, because I moved far enough for that, it was referred over, and just had a really good relationship with him and actually discussed the options at full, took a vacation to decide. Because <laughs> it's a hard thing to go, sort of turn your back on three years of... Trying to save the leg. Exactly. And now you're saying, okay, all that was sort of for naught, 
and now we're going to go in a different direction. Yeah, because you become very invested. I think sometimes you become too invested in trying to save the life. Right. But yes. it's your body. You yeah. should be invested with your oh, body. Yeah, yeah. So I, but, we understand, you know, but to, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's very hard to get an outside yeah. perspective on yourself. And so yeah. what, when do you remember? Was there a, like a light bulb went on and said, I'm going to have the surgery? Yeah, uh, I think it was like, the, well, I don't know if there was a light bulb, but after my like the third time the tibia didn't fuse to itself, I think the back of my head was, I think what, by the time my doctor was like, listen, we need to decide, like, should we continue to do this or maybe think about amputation? I think I already had decided, mm. but I don't know when I made that decision, if that right. makes sense. And when you did have the amputation, how scary was that? And when you came out of it, how long was it before you felt like, okay, this was the right decision? It was initially, well, I had kind of a complicated amputation because we also extended the tibia that wouldn't fuse to make a longer. Yeah. So it took a long, the recovery was pretty significant, but. And when was that? So that was November of 2016. Oh, okay. And because they moved so much mass from the other stuff to try to extend the bone, I had a pretty significant revision, which I believe was in February or March of 2017. So that's so not that, that long pretty, ago. No. Wow. Now that I'm saying it, it's really not. <laughs> it feels like a lifetime ago. I mean, it all does. But so, Sarah, for you, uh, that was your reality. You were born missing your leg above the knee. You had a sort of a cathartic moment where you met, was it Patty? Mm -hmm. Was a woman who basically showed you could be an athlete again? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, um, what's interesting about disability is that it can happen at any time in your life. I had it as a kid, so I had my childhood to sort of adapt to my own identity of being a girl with a disability. Right. And I needed to have role models, though, to show me what was possible. Because when I went to school every day, all the kids in my class, they all had two legs. And um, I had to do sports differently. So when I met another person who was like me, another runner um, that was doing races and, and, and you know, living a full life with a prosthetic leg, that really shifted my own thinking about myself and what I could do. And that's what I love about being involved with the Challenge Athletes Foundation is um, we want to shorten that gap no matter right. what age you are, whether you're seven years old, 23 years old, or 73 years old. We want to, we have so many mentors and other folks that help meet folks like Alex right. shortly after their injury to show them the possibility. Some of it is is the cool stuff that like we're here at the Boston Marathon. We talk about the marathons you can do and the 10Ks you can do, but sometimes it's just relating on how do you wear your leg to work all day? How do you, what kind of shoes do you wear? How do you handle things, you know, dating again? You know, right. all those types of mentorship things that are important to cover, um, and sport is a great vehicle for healing, but those mentorship, uh, relationships are so important in sports and in so many areas of life when you're learning to how to live with a disability. Sure. So for Alec, what did you know about the whole world of prosthetics and amputees and, and did you do a little <laughs> research online? Have you met some other amputees? Uh, Let's hold the mic a little closer. Sure. Sorry. So I, I don't think I knew a lot at all really um, and what I did know about prosthetics and amputation was very general you know it was sure. kind of like oh that's cool but never really you saw it on TV yeah. right or something yeah and I'd, yeah I was there I wasn't I guess I'd fallen into a pattern of not thinking about getting an amputation at that point so when I started thinking about that again it was more so that was more pressing right but um, I did go into next step um, and talk to someone with a prosthetic I had I think um, a peer counselor not officially through one of the Boston hospitals but I did have people I could talk to um, yes. that I was put in contact with, uh, especially through like physical therapy and the people they know. So there's like a evolving community of people. I didn't have like one, you know, mentor per se, but I was able to meet a variety of different, Sure. get a lot of different perspectives. And that was yeah. really, really important to me. What's, and also, I'm sorry. What, as you say, what's been the toughest part of about adapting to a prosthetic leg? Uh, remembering when it's not on. <laughs> is big <laughs> hopping out of bed and forgetting you sort of getting out of bed yeah, yeah uh, that's a big one yeah. yeah 
It's. I think I took to it quite fast, actually. I don't. I don't yeah. Maybe that's just due to age or something. But sure. or being an athlete, I think sometimes yeah. it helps, um, or it can help when you have a level of physical fitness, mm -hmm. and suddenly you're rehabbing through physical therapy. It's a whole new fitness program. You know, yeah. crutching around it takes a lot of work, and then learning on the new leg, it all takes work. And so I think if you're an athlete before, it helps that rehab sure. process. Sure. Yeah. And we've had such a great era of you know our athletes doing more than they've ever done before you know sarah became the first single above the amputee woman to finish the iron man and then was on the amazing race and before that was running marathons and half marathons and before that above the amputees were not really doing that right not too much no no it was sort of new right yeah. and now you know we've got athletes doing the iron man we've got athletes a hand cycle athletes doing the race across america there's there's more awareness that wait a second it's a level playing field in sport. Why can't I do whatever the heck I want to do? So, yeah. Sarah, for you, what was the toughest adaptation from, okay, I'm, I've, I've had a walking leg and I've been playing sport, but realizing I could ride a bike, I could swim, I could run, and I can compete in the toughest event on the planet? Yeah, I think I followed a lot of examples of other amputees that were out there doing it. I figured if a guy like Jim McLaren could do the Ironman on one leg, I could figure it out too. The other missing piece, though, was the access to the equipment that you need to participate mm. in sports. So, um, you know, oftentimes insurance companies, they'll pay for your everyday legs, but right. they're not going to pay for a running leg. And my first three marathons I did with my walking leg because you couldn't I, afford it. I didn't have a running leg, so if I wanted to do sport I just used the leg that I had so I used my everyday leg but the unlock of being able to do more marathons or do an Ironman really came when I got that running leg so that I was running more efficiently and once I had that flex run my times in the marathon went down to like I was 37 minutes faster because it was just 37 like, minutes yeah wow. Wow. which it was just lighter it was it's built to run it's you know it's uh, biomechanically designed to keep you running so once I got faster then I got fast enough to do the uh, the Ironman I could do the marathon fast enough and then finding that prosthetic to um, so I could ride a bicycle uh, better and more efficient but that was another piece of equipment I needed I needed a cycling leg so that was a big barrier to entry was just getting the right equipment you know I knew that my body could adapt and my mind was adapting I was like tough if anyone could do it I'll figure out how to do it on one leg but in order to adapt you need that piece of equipment and once I got that that was a real unlock for me I know last week you were at a, a Nike running clinic uh, and not just running clinic but an adaptive sports clinic up on the Nike campus wheelchair basketball sit volleyball running for amputees how much more awareness has there been because of what CEF is doing? Last year, what, 2,448 grants, $3.7 million was given out. And like you said, insurance doesn't cover any of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I don't think sports is a luxury. Um, I don't think getting a running leg is a luxury item. And in fact, I know I'm healthier because I have that running leg. So it's always, it always seems counterintuitive that insurance companies don't pay for it because I'm actually you're less of an insurance I'm risk now. I'm less of an insurance risk because I'm keeping my heart rate down. I'm not, you know, I don't have uh, diabetes. I'm, you know, fighting heart disease. So it just keeps you healthier overall. And I think there's this mental component that it's tough to deal with your new body. And, and, and there's a healing power of sport. And that running for me made me feel comfortable in my skin again. And I felt okay having one leg um, yeah. once I discovered that running. So. So, Alec, I know that you have applied to Challenge Athletes Foundation for a running leg. Yes. And these running legs are about $15,000. And we wanted to make sure uh, that this is not the exact leg you're going to get. But fine. you, my friend, are going to become part of the CAF family. And Sarah Reinertsen is here to make sure that you have the running leg. So if there's any sport, anything that you want to do, that you're going to have the equipment to take care of that, and you're going to be part of our CAF family forever and ever and ever. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, <laughs> hard to underestimate how much community means, in a sense, you know. So, so I'm humbled. <laughs>
Well, look, and this is really I, yeah, cool. Yeah, so this is my, this is, you know, you can check it out. This is actually my running leg, but we'll get you one in your size that will fit you. So that's that why we wanted helpful. you to come today. We wanted to give you a running leg. Here We're here at the Boston Marathon, but we wanted to give back to the community of Boston and being a Massachusetts representative <laughs> and now here living in Boston, we wanted to make sure that you got your very own uh, running leg. Exactly. You don't have to do the Boston, but it's always out there if you I want to. But, yeah, uh, there we go. So a year from now, you never know. You, you never might know. be here sitting with us going, hey, I yeah. got this leg a year ago, and I'm running the Boston Marathon. So for people who are just coming up, we just gave Alec McManus a $15,000 running leg. He lost his leg just last year and got a prosthetic, and now he's going to be able to run and do whatever the heck he wants to do. How about a round of yeah. applause for yeah. Mr. Alec yeah. McManus? Yeah. How fun is that? <laughs> Alec. So. Hey, thank you so much. I couldn't. So. I don't have words. And it really... The, just access to this material is, is everything, this equipment. It's very it difficult. Really, it is. And what's great about these legs, and people wonder why are these cost $15,000, they have to be built specifically to you, to your leg volume and your leg length, and they'll be adapted because you'll be working with your, you are working with one of the best prosthetist groups in the country. So you have a yes, step I'm up right, right yeah, away. Yeah, you've got a great team. They'll fit the custom socket for you. This is the Oser Flex Run, which is the distance running foot. And then we have a custom Nike sole that goes on that, but we can change the tread out for different running conditions on that. Um, so that's kind of the type of running foot that would be appropriate for you. It's a distance <laughs> running foot. And um, uh, so yes. So no, this is, fantastic. but in addition, this is, this is as close as I get to crying. Of <laughs> joy, I think. Awesome. Well, it's not very often that we get to have Christmas in April. I love that. But it's since it's best. snowing it outside, boom, it really does There's feel like Christmas in April here. But so in addition, good. here, so you've got that running leg. We'll put it to the side for now. We'll just lean it right here against my chair, okay. perfect. But in addition to, the, to that, we brought you a special box in here. There's a, a couple things. You got a CAF running, a CAF shirt. So you've got your very it's own CAF dr dry fit okay. to start your training, so you can feel part of the, the family, the, fi the, family yeah. the CAF family. And additionally, I got you a special pair of shoes, um, and these are called the Nike Pegasus Fly Ease. And what's so cool about these, not just that they're Boston Red Sox colors, but cool. they have a zipper on the back. Maybe you can demo for me so I can hold the mic. If you pull that tab out, you're gonna pull that out and then zip it around, the heel of the shoe opens oh. up. So when you can't articulate your ankle with that prosthetic foot, it's really easy to slide on. And you have both That's hands, great. but if you were an arm amputee, even with just a finger grip, you don't need to tie your shoes, you just pull that right around. And so you don't even need to tie. So even if you were an arm amputee and you couldn't tie your shoes, you could do it very easily. But a lot of my friends have Parkinson's or who have had strokes, that, that is really easy to tie. So these are just like the uh, Pegasus, um, the Nike Pegasus, same technology, airbag in the front. But we added this Fly Ease technology because we want to make shoes that fit every athlete. And some of our athletes are challenged athletes or might have disabilities you see or don't see. So that's what this is about. Special Fly Ease for you. They're available in the Nike store now, not always available in the stores, but I got you a pair today and brought them over so you would go home with these and you could start your training right away and you could come fly with us. Perfect. <laughs> Thank wow, you so much. Wow, Sarah. Hey, so the, speaking of that, yes. what I love is, you know, like you, this is graphite, right? This is, this is carbon, titanium, fiber. carbon fiber. Carbon fiber. And this wears out. So, this does. So was that sort of the genesis behind building what we... What did they name this? Because you so, designed yeah. this in the Nike kitchen. The yes. So oh, this wow. Nike sole, um, it actually comes off. It slides on and off with this tab here. And they used to. Um, what I used to do is I tear. I would take Nike shoes, rip them apart, mm -hmm. take the soles of the Nikes and glue them to the bottom of this. Then when it wore off, I would take a paint scraper thing and like scrape it all off rip apart another shoe and glue it on. So Nike started making these for me. We called them the Sarah Soul originally. <laughs> but now they come with every running blade that you buy. And True. You so Oser has a partnership with Nike. Yes. So every oh, wow. running blade, every um, Oser running blade comes with the Nike Soul. They also now make a Nike Track Soul. This is a more of a trail tread on the bottom. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> so they're making soles for your running blades and for your shoes. But it's kind of cool that the technology integrates so seamlessly. 
That so. is the coolest thing. I love it. So yeah. So what are you thinking? I'm overwhelmed with emotion. <laughs> 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 this is the guy who can like, cover uh, up his emotion. I yeah. like it. I don't know how not to. <laughs> <laughs> that is very cool. That but is I'm, very I'm cool. incredibly humbled and just, there aren't words for how much something like this means. It's very cool. Well, we but love we I'm, love I'm, having you with us. And, well, thank you. And every time we come to Boston and we do running yeah, clinics up here in Boston, we do running clinics in New York, uh, CEF yeah. does yeah. our Nike Osa running Boston. clinics all over the world, all over the country. So. And having you there I'll once you get fitted. So you're going to be on the phone Monday, or not Monday, but oh, maybe yeah. Tuesday to I your prosthetist. You have an appointment. I get, you have an yep. appointment. I love it. We have, <laughs> yep, and I do have a great prosthetist. Next yeah. step. Yes. There. Plug Arthur. <laughs> Arthur yeah. Graham. Um, but yeah, so I'll be seeing him this week and dealing with the insurance angle yes. and moving forward and thinking about that as little as possible. But now you've got the running blade. We're yeah. so excited to see what you can do with it. I'm going to come back to Boston just so we can run together. <laughs> I love I look that. forward and to yeah, it. That'd yeah, that'd be fun. Absolutely. We'll do a run. Very cool. Alec, thank you for coming down. Well, thank you for having me here so much. This has been it's a good day. <laughs> <laughs> good. And Sarah, as always, you are oh, thanks, such Matt. a legend. What Sarah does thanks. for Challenge Athletes Foundation. And we now have raised $103 million for Challenge Athletes Foundation. Sent oh, out wow. 21,000 grants last year. 2,448 grants totaling $3.7 million to keep challenged athletes in the game of life through sport, and that's what it's all about. Today we get to surprise Alec, and you never know who we're going to surprise next. That's the best thing in the world. This is Breakfast with Bob, Boston edition. We are surprising and giving away grants. Presented and hosted by Highland, Stop Your Cramp, Not Your Race, and by Polar, Chase Your Destiny. Hold on, everybody. We will be right back.